Hey guys! Hey, last time we spoke, we started 6.1 and we talked about rate expression where the rate of the reaction, let's go back here. A rate of a reaction, okay, is based on how much reactant is depreciating and how much of the product you are gaining per unit time. So in the expression, we would say that the const uh, the difference in the concentration of A over time to the negative because you are having less and less and less A. Same with B. Okay, as this reaction proceeds, you are actually getting less and less B. And again, when this reaction proceeds, you're getting more and more C and you're getting more and more D. So you divide them through time and these are of course positive entity while A and B are negative entity. Now that's all cool and all. However, if you're talking about whatever rate you got, it's for this one, it's really based on that you have one to one to one. But what if you don't? Well, it's very simple. All you have to do here is for this question, if this was A right here, just divide it by A. Okay, if there's a B here, you, you divide it by B, etc. and etc. Pretty sure you get the idea, just like what I have stated here. So that's the rate expression. Now, we also looked at how to um, graph you know, a rate in this case. Okay, so I have right here um, data, okay, that we talked about, which I'm pretty sure we took up. And um, to find the average rate, you draw a secant between two points that you want to find average on. For instantaneous rate at a particular time, you draw a tangent in that particular time. And most importantly, the one that you're probably going to use the most, which is initial rate, because the initial rate of reaction pretty much dictates the rate of this reaction. You're doing a tangent line through the origin. So pretty neat, pretty neat. So today we're going to look at the collision theory. We talked about how fast the reaction can be. And let's talk about how the reaction actually proceed. So for a reaction to actually happen, the two participating reactants must collide. They must hit each other with lots of force. First of all, they have to collide, okay? In a way that they hit each other with enough energy for them to react. This enough energy is known as activation energy. And the variable for that is EA. Sounds like a video game company, all right? So when two particles hit each other and did not reach the activation energy, well, they're really just hitting each other and no reaction will occur. But if they hit each other with a lot of force, oh, basically overcoming this activation energy barrier, they will react. Okay, So we'll look into more into EA a little bit when we start looking at the Maxwell uh, Boltzmann distribution graph. Number two, okay, the colliding particles must be colliding at the right place. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at this little diagram. Let's take a look at this little cartoon right here. Okay, right here, you have chlorine reacting with, I guess, CLNO, whatever this is. Basically, the two chlorine has to get together to form chlorine gas and nitrous oxide. However, in order for this to happen, the colliding molecule must be right, meaning that the orientation has to be correct. Also mean that the chlorine here has to hit the chlorine here for the reaction to occur. 
what if you're not hitting at the right place? Let's say the chlorine is hitting the oxygen. Bang! Oh, check this out. Nothing happened. Why did that nothing happen? Well, that's pretty simple. You're not hitting at the right place. Right? The reaction is supposed to produce chlorine gas. In order to produce chlorine gas, chlorine mix needs to make contact with chlorine. If chlorine is making contact with somebody else, and that's not what the react reaction product is going to be, I ain't gonna get nothing. So what happened is that this thing needs to reorient to look like this, then hit, then you'll get it right. One of the things that we understand last time is that particle is always, always moving. In the uh, kinetic molecular, molecular theory of matter, one of the things that they said is that molecules are always, always vibrating. Always. So even though in this orientation, you did not get a product, but trust me, this guy will hit this guy again, and hopefully this time when it hits, it hit at the right spot. Right? Number three, oh, which we kind of talked about already. Yeah, yeah. But why did I talk about this here? I mean, number one is supposed to be just two things finding each other. Number two, hit it at the right place. Number three, hit it with the right amount of energy. So here you go, that's the collision theory in terms of a reaction. That's, that's simple, I guess. Here's something very, very important, okay? Activation energy. For a reaction to occur, okay? Remember, you have to input a little bit of energy to break the bonds, if you remember correctly. And hopefully, when the bonds reform, it is stable enough where you get more energy at it. Or, if it's not stable enough, you might have to invest as a net. The investment of energy is what we were talking about earlier, the activation energy. This is called the potential energy diagram. This is actually very important, okay? You have your reactant here. Your reactant has a certain amount of energy. We remember the fact that it is delta H, okay? Your product has a certain amount of energy, okay? Based on its delta H. So if the energy of the reactant is higher than the energy of the product, you can say that the difference here is going to be exothermic, okay? Now, come to think of this, come to think of this, this is known as the activation energy. Okay, this is the energy that this reaction has to go through or be able to get over before the reaction can proceed. All right? So for any reactant, in order for them to form products, they have to get through this activation energy barrier. And afterwards, you're just making the bonds. In this case, you're going to get energy back. And hopefully you get so much back that your product end up being less potentially than the reactant. If that's the case, this is an exothermic uh, situation. Now, what would an endothermic situation be like? Let's draw that. Okay, an endothermic reaction uh, situation is when you have some sort of reactants. Again, you have to get over the activation energy barrier. Of course, once it starts forming products, you are start going to be making money. Making money, making money, but ah, you don't make enough money. Your product right here is still high in terms of potential. Still high in terms of potential. You did not 
get back what you invested. So your EA is what you invested. What you got back was really not enough. This situation right here, okay, gives you what we call an endothermic situation. Whereas here, yeah, you invested something, you invested something, and when it times to cut back, you're getting back way more than you invested. So energy gets released in the form of heat, in the form of light, in the form of motion, whatever it is, you're doing work. Happy times. But in this case, you're investing all right, but what you're getting back huh, is not more than what you invested. So therefore energy has to be overall inputted, inputted, inputted. As I said again, nature favors this situation a whole lot more. So that is the activation energy that I'm talking about. The investment of energy for reaction to proceed. Which we talked about here. Okay? This could be heat. Most of the time actually is, is heat. Okay? Because when you heat things up, these things vibrate more, they hit each other with more forces, and they probably get to a right orientation more often. I don't know. As a result, that is your activation energy barrier. All right. So what are some of the factors affecting rate? Well, there, there are four main factors. The first factor, which is pretty simple to understand, is concentration. Concentration definitely affects rate. Now, why? Well, think about it. Let's say you have a beaker, okay? And you have salt solution, okay? Some sort of solution, I don't know, some sort of ions or something. Isn't it obvious that they're gonna be hitting each other? There'll be collisions between these particles, right? Remember what we said earlier, the more collisions, the stronger the collision, the more right-oriented the collision, the more chances the reaction will occur, the faster the chances it will occur. Let's say we have a higher concentration. In higher concentration, what we meant by that is that there's more solutes. Check out how often do these guys hit each other? Remember, these guys are always moving. Through the kinetic molecular theory, particles are never staying still. They're always moving. And when they hit each other, they gain more energy. And we'll see that with a, with a distribution that I'm gonna show you later, okay? Every time these guys hit each other, they gain energy, which makes them moving, which makes them move faster and faster and faster. So they will keep hitting each other. Hey. The more concentrated something is, the more likely that they're gonna hit each other and more likely they're gonna keep moving faster and faster and faster. You can even think of it as a whole bunch of, I don't know, bouncy balls in, uh, actually bouncy ball doesn't really bounce itself, but uh, you get the idea, okay? So when things are less concentrated, the likelihood of them hitting each other, of course, is a lot less. So therefore, the amount of energy is not as great. Whereas the more particles there are, there is more likelihood for them to hit each other and generate more energy and more forces. That's why at a higher concentration, the rate will definitely increase as well. Okay. So if you want to increase the rate of a reaction, well, make it a higher concentration. Temperature. Temperature is, is it's an obvious one. Why is it an obvious one? 
is because when you heat up something, so here's my beaker again, okay? And here's my, here are my particles. When you heat these, when you heat this up, these particles are gonna be vibrating and moving at a faster speed. Because they're moving at a faster speed, they're gonna hit each other with greater force. When they hit each other with greater force, hey, reaction is gonna occur. That's why sometimes, in order to kickstart a reaction, now you might wanna heat it up. That will help. And this can be explained through this little graph right here called the Boltzmann-Maxwell distribution. This is actually something that you need to know how to draw and be able to explain, okay? Down here on the x-axis, you have kinetic energy, okay? You have kinetic energy. On the y-axis, you have something that I guess it takes a little bit of thinking to figure it out. It's known as fraction. Oh, I think I spelled fraction wrong, but fraction of particles with kinetic energy. Now, what that means is this. You have a certain amount of energy, okay? This is showing how much particles will have that amount of kinetic energy. So let's say the kinetic energy is pretty high. That's it right here, it's pretty high. How many of these particles here, okay, will also have that same amount of pretty high kinetic energy? Now, it's not that important to actually uh, know how to draw one of these because you're never gonna be asked to draw one of these. You're more gonna be asked to how to manipulate one of these. Let me draw this nicer. Okay. Let me draw this nicer. So that's a Boltzmann-Maxwell distribution, obviously, you know, discovered by two guys, one called Maxwell, the other one called Boltzmann. I guess they're BFF in some way, okay? And they mentioned the fact that for every, every reaction, you can explain it with a Maxwell-Boltzmann energy diagram because every reaction has an activation energy, an energy that you need for the reaction to proceed. If you don't reach that activation energy, reaction won't proceed. That's why some reactions are so damn slow because they haven't reached that activation energy yet. So let's say the activation energy for this reaction is right here. This is your EA. Okay? Now, what's important about this Maxwell distribution diagram is that the area under the curve represents the amount of particle. Let's write that down. The area under the curve. <laughs> Calculus like. The area under the curve represents the amount of particles. Okay? So this graph right here is representing this amount of particles. This amount of particles. Now, not all the particles are reacted. Which ones? Are lucky enough to react it is the particles that got over the EA hump these okay are reacted whereas these right here who did not get through the EA hump are still unreacted So that's what the curve is basically all about. So let's say this graph is based 
at 50 degrees Celsius. Now, we've mentioned that when you increase the temperature, the rate will also increase. When the rate increase at the same amount of time, you are gonna get more products. Let me say that again, okay? When temperature increase, rate increases. That means the reaction will move at a faster speed. With the same amount of time, you are gonna get more products. Hopefully you understand that. If you don't, maybe rewind this and see if you can understand it. So what does the distribution look like? Or in this case, how would it change when you change the temperature? Now, this is not easy to do, but then somebody is gonna ask you to do. Okay, it happens all the time where this is part of an exam question or something like that. But when you change the temperature, the graph will move, it will shift. It will shift right. And the amount of fraction of particle with kinetic energy will be lower. Now, what do I mean by that? This is what I mean by that. Let's say this is at a 75 degree. It shifts, like how I shifted, okay? Check this out, check this out. Remember what I said, at the same time interval, or you can say at the same activation energy interval, you're gonna get more products. So all you have to do right here is really extend EA and this is now the amount that is reacted. Isn't it more than what we had before? Before we only had this much product reacted. Now we have this much product reacted due to the shifting of the graph. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind when you're drawing these things is that the area under the graph has to be the same. So when you draw a higher temperature, I guess, uh, distribution, try to make sure that you're doing in a way that the hump is shorter and this part is higher. So that compensates for what you have here, okay? Because this area right here, should be the same as this area right here. Hopefully you kind of understand that, okay? The distribution is not hard to understand. What you need to know how to do is that when the, con when the condition changes, can you kind of manipulate the distribution? Let's do another color. What if we increase the temperature some more? Let's say, hey, you're looking at 100 degrees. Well, it will, the hump will shift more. Okay, towards the right, and the hump will be a little lower. Now you're looking at this much in terms of what's reacted. Even more at 100 degrees Celsius. So this is one way to illustrate how temperature have the ability to cause these particles to move faster and faster so they hit each other with the right force and the right orientation more often. Okay? So that's temperature. Let's look at surface area, the third way in which rates can be affected. Surface area. Now, the more surface area there is, the more likelihood that the reaction will be faster. Take a look at this little cartoon right here. Drawings. Why did I say cartoons? Drawing. You have this thing, this bricky thing, and it wants to react with this, these balls things. 
okay? If you look at how much of this in surface area can attach to these balls, it's pretty limited. However, if you were to cut this cube into eight, like you see right here, each one of these right now can hold like two, if you're looking at two. Because what you did right here is that you increase more surface area. How do you increase more surface area? Well, it's very simple. If you cut this right here, you make this cut right here, whatever is these two are sticking together, they're not reacting with the green balls. But when you cut it, now you have these sides and you have these back. They are going to be able to increase these, these, these balls. So if you calculate all the surface area here versus here, here, all of here, there's way more surface area here. Combine more surface area, more faster the reaction is going to be. That's why, okay, if you think about it, let's say you're cooking. What's easier? What do you think will cook faster? A big piece of steak? Or chop these, this piece of steak into little pieces? I'm sure even though if you don't cook, you'll know the answer. That's why it's very, um, it's, it's not fun playing with powder. Like, you know those um, flour, okay? Make sure if you spill flour, clean it up because those things can become combustible and the surface area of flour is a lot of big surface area because they're so tiny, okay? All right, so that's surface area. That, that was actually really an easy one to understand, okay? More surface area, hey, increase the rate. So if you have something that is big and chunky, hey, don't grind it into smaller pieces so therefore, overall, collectively, there's more surface area than when they're clumped together like that. All right, lastly, ah, this one is good. This one is good. Especially those of you who are studying biology. Catalysts. And a biological catalyst is known as enzymes. There are lots of enzymes, thousands of enzymes. When you eat, the fact that you are able to do digestion in a couple of hours, it's because of all those enzymes that are in your body. First start with saliva, there's amylase. That's pretty cool. What do they do? Well, what they do is that they speed up the chemical reaction. How? Check this out. By lowering the activation energy. So remember this potential energy diagram? Okay, where you have reactant here and product here based on their potential, based on their delta H. Remember, you have to get through the activation hump. We call EA. Okay, depending on where it goes, it, it will tell you if it's exothermic or endothermic. Oh, now this one is, a, is an endothermic because you're not getting your investment back. There is an overall delta H that is positive here, man. So this reaction right here is endothermic reaction. Now what happened if you put a catalyst in there? Now when you put a catalyst in there, this happens. Look, your activation energy is a lot shorter. Meaning that getting over that hump is a lot easier with less energy required. But does that change the potential of your product. No, because look at where this ends. It ends at the same place as uncatalyzed. Still here, which means delta H overall is still the same number. The only difference is EA. EA right here is definitely a lot shorter. Hey, if it takes less activation energy to get through the hump for a product to form, trust me, it's going to be fast. And that's what amylase is doing. That's what lipase is doing. That's what 
Pepsin is doing. Trypsin. All those neat enzyme that your pancreas are able to make. They have the ability, of course, to digest food at a fast rate by doing hydrolysis. Okay. Why? Because they have the ability to lower that activation energy, whereas if your reaction are uncatalyzed, man, that piece of chicken that you ate the other day, and that ain't digesting for many, many, many years. But with enzymes, with catalysts, that chicken will be gone and out the other end in a couple of hours. You know what I mean. So let's talk a little bit about biological catalysts in terms of what it is. It's, it's have something. There's a couple of model. One of them is called the induced fit model, and another one is the, the more popular one is called the lock and key model. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about that. So I have something called lactase. Okay, lactase is an enzyme that looks like this. Okay. And his job is to break lactose. So here's lactose. Okay. Notice that there is a little well here. This is called an active site. <laughs> this well, fortunately, fits lactose. So lactose can come in here and say, hey, it fits. I am going to do whatever I'm supposed to do to you which is to break you apart. Can it do the same thing with sucrose? No, because sucrose may look like this. Look, I can't fit into the active site because this is not the right enzyme. I need to find sucrase. Well, once you have that, what you're going to get right here is a enzyme substrate complex and then its job is to break lactose into its component which is now if i remember correctly galactose and Alpha glucose. A little bit of biology in some ecology here. Hopefully you can understand the whole idea here is that if you are waiting for lactose to break apart on its own, you better you're gonna be waiting for a long, 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 long time. But with these enzyme, obviously you're lowering that activation energy to have this done in an instant. Trust me. This guy will react with water to make these, but it's hard, okay? But with an enzyme, it becomes very, very, very easy. Again, lowering the activation energy. Now, can we explain this with Maxwell Boltzmann, even though you probably hated the guys? Hated those guys? Yeah, 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 of course, let's, let's do that. Let's do that right here, let's make another Maxwell Boltzmann distribution curve. I'm beginning to draw these curves very nicely now. So remember, the x-axis is kinetic energy, okay? And the y-axis is a fraction of particles with the same amount of kinetic energy. And as you can see, if you remember, for every reaction, there is an activation energy barrier. So as you go over the kinetic energy, okay, which is the energy of motion, as your particle moves faster and faster and faster and faster, there is going to be a point where it moves fast enough for the reaction to proceed. That will be your activation energy. And these right here will be your product. However, if this reaction was catalyzed, Let's, let's use a very nice pink. 
If it's catalyzed, what will happen? Well, it will move the activation energy closer. Usually we abbreviate it with a little star. That little asterisk means catalyze activation energy. So if the, if the EA moves closer, it is quite obvious that you're going to get more products. So that's how you would illustrate the, I call it the MB distribution curve for catalyst situation. Again, I hope you understand. Okay, I do hope you, I, you, you understand. All right, so that's pretty much it in terms of, you know, factors that affect rates. Okay, and give you a little bit of a biological enzyme type of analogy as well. So if there's any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Okay, hopefully all of these things make sense to you. Okay, especially the you know, surface area is pretty easy to understand. Temperature should be easy to understand. You know, you heat things up, these guys move faster, and they will collide with each other more energy. Right? Showing here in the MB graph, when temperature increases, the distribution curve shifts. But when it shifts, you have to make sure that the area under the curve it's the same, but what you know, of course, with the same amount of activation energy, you're getting more particles being reacted. Concentration is an easy one. More solutes, more collisions, more collisions, more forces, more forces. Hey, you're getting through that EA hump and they will react. It's all about getting over that EA hump. All right, let's finish off with a little bit of uh, dry notes. And then I have a couple of questions at the back for you to do. One involves graphing again. Oh, we can't get enough of those. One involve reading a scenario and tell me what contribution factor is affecting the rate. Okay, so the first one, I uh, let's, let's finish this slide. So type of catalyst. There are these catalysts which are homogeneous. Homogeneous, I don't know, depending how you want to say it. Okay, what that means is that this catalyst has the same state, you know, solid, liquid, and gas, as the reactant. Okay, so here I have ozone react to become oxygen gas. To do that, you need a catalyst, which is chlorine gas. Look, they're all gas. That's why they're homogeneous. Some catalysts are heterogeneous, meaning that the state of the uh, catalyst is different than the state of the reactant. Okay, like for example, a catalytic converter. Okay, turning these nasty carbon monoxide or nitrous oxide into N2, CO2, and H2O, which are not harmful well, these guys cause us global warming, but at least they're not harmful. They won't kill you, kill you. Well, this one will kill you. This one causes acid rain. So this catalytic converter will turn these gas into something else. And a catalytic converter, obviously, is a solid. Okay. And, of course, you have the biological catalyst, which I already illustrate known as enzymes okay they exist in your body why are they there well because your dna has the coding to code for these guys your ribosome okay will read a copy of your dna known as mrna okay and your ribosome will pick out proteins to to build okay basically your dna has instructions to make protein it has the blueprint to make a particular protein. You want to make amylase? Well, your DNA has the code to make amylase. You just have to copy that code, call it an mRNA, go find a ribosome, and the ribosome will read this mRNA and put together the amino acid that it needs. And you get amylase. Simple. All right, so as I said, I have three questions for you to do. 
question number two is based on this reaction. And I'm telling you a couple of scenarios and you need to tell me uh, what is contributing to the rate of reaction. You just have to read. Ah, another graph for you to do. You just can't get enough of this. Here's another graph, okay? This is also um, looking at volume, in this case, of oxygen gas. I think there's a typo right here. Okay, make sure you uh, correct this, this typo. This is supposed to be O2, not CO2. Okay, it's supposed to be O2, so make sure you... Uh, you fix that or else you'll be thinking to yourself, oh, what am I finding O2 and this is about C and this is, well, why am I finding CO2 and this is about O2, duh. And how come this is not E, F, and G? Somebody doesn't know how to list the alphabet here, huh? Oh, damn, that would be me. That would be me. Okay, so graph this. Solve these. Okay. And uh, this one, this one I love. I love this question. Here's a rate graph. How would the rate graph change given these scenarios? The first one, half the amount of HCl and lower the concentration of it. The second one, same concentration of HCl, but the other is going to be grinded. So I want you to sketch on this graph. I want you to tell me, how would this graph look if these condition changing, well, well the, with these changing conditions, okay? So try those and we'll take it up the next day. All right, I hope you understand all of this. If you don't, let me know. I'll see you guys later, bye.